because I used to work in advertising, I quite like to start my uh, my presentation, my sort of sessions with a bit of um, with a bit of uh, film trailers, as it were. So I'm just going to play a couple of things that we're, that I'll then kind of come back and pick up on. So. You are a good person. You spend time with your family. You work out at the gym. Come on, push, push. You can serve water while showering. You like nice clothes. You give to charity. You recycle. You drive a Prius, but you use your bike when you can. You enjoy the occasional distraction at work, and you always send a card on Mother's Day. Always. But there's a part of you that tells yourself that you're not so good, that you could be doing more, that the world is falling apart at the seams, and all you've been doing is yoga. One day, you see that the rainforest is being destroyed at a staggering rate of 32 million acres a year. That's the equivalent of one football field every 78 seconds. You feel bad, angry, guilty. You've been apathetic for too long. You want to do something about it. You must do something about it. Well, this is what you're not going to do. I quit! You're not going to quit your job, leave your family, get on the next flight to Nicaragua, take a bus to the edge of the jungle, then hoof it across rivers, lakes, and streams on a quest to the very heart of the rainforest. Take me to the heart of the rainforest. You're getting closer. You're almost there. You have arrived. You're not going to ingratiate yourself with the local tribesmen, go to great lengths to earn their respect and trust. No, 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 no! It is around now you realize you're living out the cliche gringo fantasy of becoming an honorary native and leading the resistant forces. But screw it. If they could do it, so can you. I'm gonna save you! This guy comes over here, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna pull a zapping bats right through him, right over here. You're not gonna coordinate and occupy the rainforest movement. Realize it's hopeless, summon the power of the gods, lead a revolution against the deforesters and their multinational employers in an apocalyptic once and for all battle to save humanity, only to awaken two days later in an El Salvadorian hospital with two toes missing on your left foot, <laughs> hobble out of Central America, up through Mexico, across the Sierra Madre where you break down, have your first cigarette in four years, accidentally start a wildfire killing off the endangered species that once served as your occupational distraction, finally make it back home only to find you've been replaced at work by a guy named TJ and that things at home are not what they used to be. You're not going to do any of these things, but what you can do is follow the frog. Buying Rainforest Alliance certified products ensures the future of our rainforests so that you don't have to do the things you shouldn't do anyway. Just follow the frog. The Rainforest Alliance one is a really fascinating piece of work because it, I don't know about you, but I kind of, I, I'm going with it and going with it and then suddenly I'm just left with a sort of, ooh, really? That's, my, my agency is going shopping. That's, that's kind of, that's my role in this, is it? And there's so, so I don't want to um, kind of, I'll, I'll come back to why that's so significant, but I think, um, I just, it's, it's a really interesting one to kind of show in a room of people and kind of feel the mood change. <laughs> so um, my name's John, uh, I run a thing called the New Citizenship Project, or I'm about to start running a thing called the New Citizenship Project because we actually have our launch event tomorrow, so this is very new. What I'm going to try and do with this session, if this is cool with everybody, is um, I'm going to run through uh, a bit of what's really emerging thinking and kind of um, and it's something and it's work that's come out of uh, academic work so I'm doing a doctorate in philosophy um, and applied ethics and uh, is also quite deeply related to uh, and, and, but I've but we've set up an organization off the back of it that's already starting to kind of work with these ideas and try and apply them and it's really about how we talk to people and how we involve people in in society as citizens rather than just flogging them stuff as consumers that's the sort of short line um, uh, just to give you a bit of an intro to me, um, I, uh, co I used to work in advertising, as I say. I co-wrote this um, with Tom Crompton. This is uh, of Common Cause. I, th I think this is Common Cause stuff, and 
has been something that's been debated uh, across the ECF lists quite a bit. Um, and I then did this at about the same time, um, which was uh, trying to hand over the running of a real working farm to the public by decision making by vote online, which nearly killed both me, the National Trust, and several members of staff at the farm. Um, uh, and those things happened at about the same time when I was about to have to get out of an, the advertising industry. And then went to work for the National Trust and did some stuff on a campaign, uh, campaigning on children and nature, which led to uh, a National Trust campaign called 50 Things to Do Before 11 and 3 Quarters. And this film, which is um, some of you may know about, which is Project Wild Thing, which uh, is a documentary, feature-length documentary film that is at the heart of, a, of a, now a network of over 1,500 organisations around the country um, committed to reconnecting children and nature, giving every child the opportunity to uh, develop a connection with nature by the age of 12. Um, so I come at this, uh, all of which is just to say a couple of things. So firstly, Project Wild Thing uh, features in it and had as one of its key advisors, Chris Rose, and the values modes work. So for those of you who know the kind of debate between common cause and values modes, it's, uh, I, I sort of, I sit somewhere between the two, I guess. And, and I think, so if that's something we want to talk a little bit more about, how we kind of navigate that sort of people are who they are and you have to start from where they are with the kind of what's the, what's the grand vision of values. Uh, I'm really happy to go into a bit more depth on that. But what this, what this has all led to for me is, is, as I say, the New Citizenship Project. And, and so having sort of introduced myself, the, 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 I just want to introduce the theory that's behind this a little bit. Now, there's, a, there's loads of these segmentations that everybody knows, but the, 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 one of the most recent stunning ones was, um, was this from uh, a gang called Globescan, a, a, cons a sort of global consumer segmentation. And they identified a, a, a segment of 2.5 billion uh, consumers worldwide, um, using the language deliberately, mm -hmm. uh, who they called the aspirationals. And these were the two of the defining statements of the aspirationals. So 78% agree that shopping for new things excites me, and 92% agree that I believe we need to consume less to preserve the environment for <laughs> future generations. It's really fascinating because in my old world of kind of marketing, advertising, this is being taken as kind of the new market, the kind of the, the people to sell to, and and the language of aspiration is used. And what we what we were discussing, what I was discussing with Chris from Globescan was, isn't on these more accurately depicted as the conflicted. Uh, there's a sort of quite a deep thing going on where we're, where we're holding some quite difficult stuff at one and the same time. Uh, and I think that um, what we've been trying to do is try and dig into that a little bit more. So this was an ad that was on the wall of a building in Davos at the, uh, at the World Economic Forum this year. Um, and it's just, I just find it fascinating that, that this is so self-declaredly the, the dream that we're heading for. So I guess the, 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 the thing that we're working with is, is at one level it's about what's the language uh, that we use to describe people? What, what is the story of the individual in society today and, and, and what does that do? Um, so at the level of what, this seems, this, we did this little Google Engram thing, this is, this is what's going on. We, we, the, the idea of people as consumers is, is the, it has become the dominant language of, of society. Um, and, and when you dig into this, um, what came out through all of the work that I was doing with, with in, in kind of ethics and advertising with that report I flicked up at the beginning really comes to this question, what are we doing to ourselves when we tell ourselves we're consumers all the time? Because and we are telling ourselves we're consumers all the time. What, what, what does that produce? And we started digging into this more and more and, and the, 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 the core of it um, the, the simplest way to kind of express why it's so concerning is this um, is a study that was done. A uh, thousand people were given a survey of environmental and social attitudes. Um, and for 500 people, the front cover of that survey said consumer response survey. Uh, and for 500 people, the front cover of that survey said citizen response survey. And levels of environmental and social uh, uh, motivation were much lower on the consumer response survey. So this is one word was the only difference, one word priming effect. Uh, and what people express in that, it, then express, is much lower motivation. And we've just replicated this uh, ourselves with a little study where we just asked people how important is it to participate in society. And for, some, for a small group, of, for, a, for, for half the sample, we previously asked them, to what extent do you agree that it's important to find brands that reflect your personality? Um, and no matter how much they agreed with that statement, 
they agreed with that it made them less likely to say it's important to participate in society just by being shown that statement. And so when you and then when you consider what what the priming impact we have when when this is this and more is that is the kind of background narrative of society when when we're reporting consumer confidence every day when even or even organisations that arguably shouldn't be are talking about people as consumers rather than as rather than as something else and we'll come on to citizen in a bit. What are we? Are we undermining the very thing that we're trying to achieve? The very aspirations that we should that we have by the language that we're using and by the aspirations that we're kind of assuming on people. Um, so I just want to colour a little bit more um, what what I mean when I talk about consumer and citizen because the, the the classic um, it can sound like it's a false. Uh, it's a kind of false dichotomy when, because we all consume, right? We all we all buy stuff. I, I we all we all eat. We all drink. That that's consumption, and and I think that the the key thing to say, the way we think this works, is we think of it as as that we're and that we're playing lots of different roles all at once in society. So we think of it as I'm a consumer and a citizen and a parent and a shareholder and a uh, and a whatever. Um, and, and the thing that I'm kind of increasingly convinced of is that actually what, what happens is that something enters that role, that kind of the role above, and starts to kind of inf affect everything else. And, I th and the, the hypothesis that, that, I'm, that we're working with and, uh, and increasingly convinced of is that the, the, the idea of the consumer has actually kind of come up and become the, the meta role and started to affect everything else. So from uh, how I behave uh, as a citizen, so this idea that, that the act of voting has become an act of kind of individual self-interest purchasing rather than, uh, and you can see that in how the framing of discussions about who you're going to vote for. Um, the idea of um, shareholders as consumers, something back so we've talked about, and this, the, this notion of um, shareholding is considered to be own a financial transaction that, that you get something out of rather than a, an act of kind of expression of your values. Uh, parents are shareholders, so Project Wild thing, a, a major part of that is uh, dig was digging into kind of what's going on with childhood materialism in, in this country and across. Um, employees as consumers uh, in relation to the company, so, so we are, when we go and work for a big organisation we tend to be framed as kind of a, cons as, as a sort of in transaction with that organisation rather than bringing our own values to bear on it. So this, this is the, so when I say, and this is why I sometimes when I'm writing about this stuff it's, it feels slightly wanky to do it, excuse my French, that's on record isn't it, good. Uh, but the um, but I use a kind of capital C, so so capital C consumer rather than small C at that level, um, and just to sort of again pitch into that, there's there's some really interesting uh, research uh, again social psychology field about the 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 difference between the noun and the verb. So when you are when you consume, you buy something, whatever that's, or you. But when it becomes the noun as the consumer, it becomes an identity construct. So the, most of this work has been done in other fields with things like voting. So when people say I vote, they're reasonably likely to vote. When they say I am a voter, they will definitely vote. So, so, so this is this is kind of this is the sort of the the critique, I guess. The the the, the what are we the the question? What are we doing to ourselves? The the answer to and and saying this is this is the problem, um, and I guess um, the reason why I'm sort of both academicing and uh, practitionering is because this it feels too too big a thing to just to just talk about the problem. Um, so what we've been trying to do is start to work out what can we actually do about this. So uh, first shot is St Mary's Church in Putney, um, where we are holding our launch event tomorrow, which none of you can come to, but never mind. Um, but the, 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 the theme of this, so this is the church where in the 1650s, uh, in 1649 in fact, when Charles I was under house arrest at Hampton Court Palace, the revolutionary forces gathered at St Mary's Church in Putney to debate how you run a kingdom without a king, and the idea of universal suffrage was first proposed in Putney church. So we're going back there and our launch event is about 21st century people power. What does it mean to be citizens in the 21st century rather than just accept the role that we're given? Um, so we're exploring that. 
Um, and so this, is, so p the first part of our work is about how do we kind of create the, some moments around this story of people as citizens rather than just as consumers, to to give that give that give that story a little bit of oxygen. We're starting in very small ways. Um, this is another of the areas that we're working on. So this this image was it was um, given to me by a guy called Richard Leave who works on uh, consumerization of childhood in the states. And um, this and there's a stat that uh, the average child uh, of 12 uh, in America can identify over a thousand corporate brands or logos and fewer than 10 species of flora and fauna. Um, so one of the things we work. One of the critical things for us is how do you start to create the space for this for a different story to emerge? So if we are telling ourselves we're consumers three thousand times a day from the age of kind of six years old, how do we start to give how do we retreat from that a little bit and at least allow a little bit of space? So one of the things we're working on is starting to bring together um, a potential campaign around advertising to children. But that needs that needs a lot of work, a lot of framing. So I really wanted to just call that out to people and say, anyone who wants to, who can help me think about that, help us think about that, I'd really appreciate it. Um, so that's a couple of the things we're doing. Um, to one of the things we're doing in uh, in more kind of organisational spaces, we're working, still working with the National Trust. And what we're working on with them at the moment is around uh, membership. So membership of the National Trust has become very much, the National Trust had become very much a consumer brand. Uh, it had become a days out uh, seller. And the work I was doing there for, uh, was about how do we move from that to an organisation that, that rather than flogging days out to consumers, mobilises love of place in people. And so the quite big challenge for membership at the National Trust is how do you move away from a model where membership is framed as purely a kind of season ticket transaction, uh, free entry, to a symbol of, of an expression of values, an expression of my love of place, an expression of, of relationship. Um, and we've just been exploring these sorts of things. So th this, is, this is how the Trust currently, or until last year, spoke about membership. Red sales language kind of very much and so how do you, but of course you need that, you need some of that to be able to run a viable business, it's a core revenue stream, so how do you try and explore that framing? This, and this is one of the key questions that, that, um, that we're working on, is how, how, do you, how do you bring that value in such that you aren't engendering a very transactional relationship with your organisation, but you are still making sure that you're gaining the value. What's really interesting is that the one or two trials we've done with them, we've actually found that um, moving towards something more closer to what's in the centre, um, you've still got your kind of promotional message, but what you get um, is we've seen churn rates, so the, the extent to which people lapse after a year of membership of the National Trust has gone down, so loyalty is increasing. Um, so why is loyalty increasing? But so because you're, in, you're coming into the relationship on a more, uh, on a, on a more values basis, on a, on a kind of, on an, emotional, on an emotional relationship rather than purely a financial transaction, uh, you're, you bring people into something, so people are, I think what we the the sort of qual research we've done around it's just people feel that they're buying into something rather than buying something from us, um, and this so this is the, this is some uh, a little bit of the thinking that we've been doing at the trust is is about how do you move from what they've become, which is a kind of separate consumer brand that that makes the money for the organisation and a charity brand that sort of hides behind the scene and spends the money. Uh, to more of an organisation that, that feels like one thing. Um, so it's a, it's a slightly glib point, but it, it can be quite a useful thought platform for, for, for charities. Happy to go into this a little bit more. Um, another example, so working with the BBC um, at the moment around uh, the question, so the language of the BBC is very much in the, in the age of the consumer. It's a British Broadcasting Corporation. They think of people as audiences and consumers, they think of their product as channels and programmes. Um, the work, we, we've just been doing some really lovely work, interesting work with them around what, what if you thought of yourselves as the British culture collaboration and you thought of people as participants in that culture and sort of citizens of culture rather than just consumers of content. Um, it's provoking some really interesting questions. 
Um, and then one of the other projects we're doing is talking to Unilever a little bit, and this um, and it came out of uh, this experience um, a few years back, where um, when I was working for an ad agency, and we pitched an ad to them, and we, this is what we ended up running: what you buy in the supermarket can change the world, with a picture of the rainforest. And the, the brief was: how do we get people to want to buy more sustainable palm oil, uh, and to look for, actively look for it in products? Um, and this was what ended up running. But what we pitched was um, this image with the headline, uh, <laughs> someone guilty of this? Um, <laughs> with the headline, this was our wake up call, this is yours. And what was really interesting about this was that the idea was to say, let's, uh, the impact would have been to endorse activism, endorse participation at a, at a level beyond just consumption. And that was, and that it couldn't, they couldn't quite go there. Um, but they're really, they're genuinely really interested in the conversation now as to how can they, how, they're, they're genuinely going, we need to, things just need to accelerate. We can't tell people they have to stay in their boxes as consumers anymore. How do we talk to people on a level that gets a bit, that can, that respects what they're capable of more? So that's a fascinating conversation. So just the uh, last thing is just to, just to call out a couple of the fascinating organisations that we're, we're sort of making ourselves a bit of a hub of from around the world. So if people haven't heard of Lumio, um, really fascinating online group decision making tool that's been developed in New Zealand, really worth a look. Um, uh, Partido de la Red, people may well know the, the net party in Argentina. Um, uh, who, and they have a fascinating idea which is about a opening, yes, about using the web to uh, people to to participate in how their elected representatives would actually vote in 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 when they're representing, but but to have to facilitate online discussion about how that vote should be cast. So there's deliberation built into their model as well as just aggregation. Uh, CityVox in Mexico, very similar thing, and Borgalist in Denmark, which is a great organisation that um, are facilitating mass group conversations uh, all over Denmark uh, in town halls and so on. Um, and then I just, uh, very last thing, I just wanted to f uh, finish on this as a, as a bit of a link into um, discussions around data, because one, one of the things, and as I say, this is all really quite raw, kind of emerging thinking, but the more I look into some of these big issues that are looming on the horizon for us, the more I think this idea of the kind of consumer citizen framing is vital. So this is, this is um, uh, I'll just read it out, but this is, this is um, Jaron Lanier, who was one of the kind of original uh, gurus at the beginning of the web, the guy who coined the term virtual reality. And this is his kind of dystopia for where we're going. So you sit at the edge of the ocean, wherever the coast will be after Miami is abandoned to the waves. You're thirsty. Random little plots of dust are full-on robotic interactive devices, since advertising companies long ago released plagues of smart dust upon the world. That means you can always speak and some machine will be listening. I'm thirsty. I need water. The seagull responds, you are not rated as enough of a commercial prospect for any of our sponsors to pay for fresh water for you. You say, but I have a penny. Water costs two pennies. There's an ocean three feet away. Just desalinate some water. Desalinization is licensed to water carriers. You need to subscribe. However, you can enjoy free access to any movie ever made or pornography or a simulation of a deceased family member for you to interact with as you die from dehydration. Your social networks will be automatically updated with the news of your death. And finally, don't you want to play that last penny at the casino that just repaired your heart? You might win big and be able to enjoy it. It's, and so the, the point I'm sort of making with this is if we, and, and it's not really called out in a lot of these discussions, but as we go into these, this age of data and this age of, uh, we are going into it at the moment as consumers and we're, prepared, and we're pretty much prepared to give up all of our information as long as we get something free in return. And, but if, so if we go into, into this age in, in that orientation, uh, increasingly I think we're in big trouble. If we, if we go into it as citizens kind of owning our own agency, then, the, then campaigns for digital rights and so forth actually have a fertile ground to go into. Unless that narrative of the individual changes, I, I, I think they're going to struggle. And so, so I suppose the, 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 the final point I make before we sort of get into a bit of a chat is I feel like this idea of the, of the, of the story of the individual shifting is just such a critical intervention to enable campaigns on climate change, to enable us to deal with the challenge of data. Um, and 
that's so that's what we're kind of trying to uh, open up and work on. Um, that's my details. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch or follow or or harangue, then please do.